I will not be going over this slide with you, so I'd like you to compare our drawing with these diagrams to review the layers of the pericardium and the layers of the wall of the heart. Remember that the pericardium consists of the fibrous pericardium, the parietal pericardium, and the visceral pericardium, which is also known as the epicardium, while the wall of the heart consists of the epicardium, the myocardium, and the endocardium. In addition, take note of the tissues and structures found in these layers that was discussed in the last slide. In addition to cardiac muscle tissue, the myocardium also contains collagen fibers and elastic fibers. This network of connective tissue fibers is thicker and denser in some areas than others, forming the fibrous skeleton of the heart, also called the cardiac skeleton or annulus fibrosis cordis. They form four dense connective tissue fibrous rings, similar to handcuffs as they surround and structurally support the four valves of the heart. The four dense connective tissue fibrous rings are the left atrioventricular fibrous ring, the right atrioventricular fibrous ring, the aortic fibrous ring, and the pulmonary fibrous ring. The cardiac skeleton has four important functions, which include the anchoring of the valves of the heart. The left atrioventricular fibrous ring surrounds and anchors the left atrioventricular valve, also known as the bicuspid or mitral valve. The right atrioventricular fibrous ring surrounds and anchors the right atrioventricular valve, also known as the tricuspid valve. The aortic fibrous ring surrounds and anchors the aortic semilunar valve, also known as the aortic valve. And the pulmonary fibrous ring surrounds and anchors the pulmonary semilunar valve, also known as the pulmonary valve. So the names of these four fibrous rings correspond to the four valves of the heart that they surround, anchor, and structurally support. If we look at the aortic semilunar valve, which is also called the aortic valve, there are three cusps that make up this valve. Therefore, in addition to the aortic fibrous ring, there are three structures that are C-shaped or U-shaped that function as fibrous attachment sites for these three cusps. Now, if we look at the pulmonary semilunar valve, which is also called the pulmonary valve, we also have three cusps that make up this valve. Therefore, in addition to the pulmonary fibrous ring, we have the same three structures that are C-shaped or U-shaped that functions as fibrous attachment sites for the three cusps that make up this valve. We do not have these three additional fibrous attachment sites associated with the left atrioventricular fibrous ring or the right atrioventricular fibrous ring. More details later when we cover the valves of the heart. Another important function of the cardiac skeleton is it prevents the opening of these four valves from over dilating or over stretching as blood passes through them. The cardiac skeleton also provides the point of insertion for bundles of cardiac muscle, basically reinforces the myocardium and anchors the cardiac muscle tissue. The last important function of the cardiac skeleton is it blocks the direct spread of electrical impulses across the entire heart. The details will be further discussed in the physiology. We are now going to discuss the chambers, the valves, and the associated great vessels of the heart. We begin with the chambers of the heart. There are four chambers. Therefore, our heart is said to be a four-chambered heart, as are all mammalian hearts. Sheep, cows, dogs, pigs, rats, dolphins, whales, for example. Let us start off with the top half of the heart, the atria. We have two atria the left atrium and the right atrium. These two chambers are the receiving chambers since they receive blood directly from veins.
They are separated by a wall called the interatrial septum. Inter means between, and septum means wall or partition. So the term interatrial septum literally means wall between atria. The interatrial septum is not seen in the diagrams below. Externally, there are small wrinkled protruding pouch-like structures called the auricles. Each atrium has an auricle. So we have a left auricle for the left atrium and a right auricle for the right atrium. These auricles slightly increase the volume of the atria. Basically, slightly increasing the volume of blood that each atrium receives from the veins. The atria have all three layers that make up the wall of the heart, the epicardium, the myocardium, and the endocardium. The myocardia of both atria have roughly the same thickness. However, when compared to the ventricles, the ventricles have a significantly thicker myocardia. It is important to note that the thickness or thinness of the myocardium has a direct effect on the force of contraction and the pressure it can produce. In other words, the thicker the myocardium, the greater the force of contraction and the greater the pressure can be generated when it contracts. While the thinner the myocardium, the less the force of contraction and the less the pressure it can produce when it contracts. So why do the atria have a thinner myocardia compared to the ventricles? It is because the atria only need to generate enough force and pressure when they contract to push the remaining blood that they receive from the veins into the ventricles. Now, if we look internally into the right atrium, we will find that at the anterior surface, but not the posterior surface, the myocardium forms ridges called pectinate muscles. These pectinate muscles extend from the anterior surface of the right atrium into the right auricle. However, if we look internally into the left atrium, we will not find these pectinate muscles in either the anterior surface or the posterior surface. Basically, the internal surface of the left atrium is smooth, but these pectinate muscles can be found in the left auricle of the left atrium. Let us now look at the bottom half of the heart, the ventricles. We have two ventricles, the left ventricle and the right ventricle. These two chambers are the discharging chambers since they will discharge or pump blood out of the heart and into arteries. The ventricles, just like the atria, are separated by a wall. This wall or partition is called the interventricular septum basically wall between ventricles. The ventricles have all three layers that make up the wall of the heart. Within each ventricle, the myocardium forms irregular ridges that crisscrosses all around the internal surface of the ventricle, called the trabeculae carnei. Additionally, the myocardium forms pillar-like or column-shaped structures called papillary muscles. These papillary muscles are anchors or attachment sites for the cordy tendini, which are part of the left atrioventricular valve, also called the bicuspid or mitral valve, and the right atrioventricular valve, also called the tricuspid valve. The cordy tendini provide additional structural support to these heart valves and help secure these valves to the papillary muscles of the ventricles. If we compare the thickness of the right and left ventricles, there will be a visible and very apparent difference between these two, as you will see in the next slide. Therefore, the pressure and force that each generates when they contract will be significantly different. More on this later. Let us now discuss the grooves, the indentations or sulci seen on the external surface of the heart.
the first one being the atrioventricular groove, also called the coronary sulcus, that wraps around most of the heart, just like a crown or tiara. It is a groove that marks the junction between the atria and the ventricles. The major coronary blood vessels, the blood vessels that serve the wall of the heart, are located in this atrioventricular groove, or coronary sulcus. The next external surface groove indentation or sulcus is the interventricular sulcus, found both anteriorly, which is called the anterior interventricular sulcus, and posteriorly, which is called the posterior interventricular sulcus. Just like the coronary sulcus, the major coronary blood vessels are also found here. Take note of the adipose tissue, the epicardial fat, that is especially thick and visible in both the coronary sulcus and the interventricular sulcus. This fat will serve as packing material to help cushion and minimize the movement of these vital and all-important coronary blood vessels. This particular slide lists some additional structures related to the four chambers of the heart, including the valves and the great vessels of the heart. As I discuss these additional structures, I will be going back and forth between this slide and the previous slide. It is important to note that veins drain blood towards the heart and into one of the receiving chambers, the atria. So a good way to remember this is to think of the letter V in veins as a funnel draining blood towards the heart. Arteries carry blood away from the heart and the blood that they receive is from one of the discharging chambers, the ventricles. A good way to remember this is to think of the letter A in artery for away. Let us focus once again on the right atrium. The right atrium receives blood from three major veins. The first major vein and one of the great vessels of the heart is the superior vena cava. Blood from regions of the body superior to the diaphragm drains into the superior vena cava and into the right atrium. The second major vein and another of the great vessels of the heart is the inferior vena cava. Blood from regions of the body inferior to the diaphragm drains into the inferior vena cava and into the right atrium. The third major vein is the coronary sinus, which is significantly smaller in diameter than the other two major veins. Blood from structures of the heart, including the myocardium, drain into the coronary sinus and into the right atrium. Let us go back to the previous slide to get a better look at the next structure that we will discuss. There is a small, shallow depression found in the interatrial septum of the right atrium called the fossa ovalis. During fetal development, this was an opening called the foramen ovale. The foramen ovale will eventually close to form the fossa ovalis before the birth of the baby. Blood from the right atrium drains into the right ventricle. However, they need to pass through the first valve of the heart, called the right atrioventricular valve, or simply the right AV valve, or the tricuspid valve. We will discuss this valve, as well as the other three valves, later. What about the left atrium? Well, it receives blood from two left pulmonary veins. Blood from the left lung drains into the two pulmonary veins and into the left atrium. In addition, we have two right pulmonary veins. Blood from the right lung drains into the two right pulmonary veins and into the left atrium. Adding these together, we have a total of four pulmonary veins, two on the right and two on the left. These four pulmonary veins are also considered great vessels of the heart. Blood from the left atrium drains into the left ventricle and will pass through the second valve of the heart, 
called the left atrioventricular valve, or simply the left AV valve, also known as the bicuspid or the mitral valve. As was previously said, we will discuss this valve and the others later. Before discussing the remaining two chambers of the heart, the ventricles, take note once again of the same thickness of the myocardium for both the right and left atria. Both the right and left atria contract at the same time, and when they do, they both generate approximately the same force of contraction and pressure. The blood that remains in the atria will be pumped into the ventricles as these two chambers simultaneously contract. Let us now focus on the right ventricle. The right ventricle receives blood from the right atrium and forms most of the anterior surface of the heart. Blood that is pumped by the right ventricle enters the pulmonary trunk, a large artery, and another great vessel of the heart. As blood enters the pulmonary trunk, it passes through the third valve of the heart, called the pulmonary semilunar valve, or pulmonary valve. What about the left ventricle? The left ventricle receives blood from the left atrium, and when it contracts, it pumps blood into the aorta, a large artery, and another great vessel of the heart. As blood enters the aorta, it passes through the fourth valve of the heart, called the aortic semilunar valve, or the aortic valve. Speaking of arteries, there's an additional structure that can be seen here that attaches the pulmonary trunk at one end and the aorta at the other end. This structure is called the ligamentum arteriosum, which is a cord or band of dense collagenous connective tissue. During fetal development, this was an opening called the ductus arteriosus. This opening connected these two large arteries together. The ductus arteriosus will eventually close, and the ligamentum arteriosum is a remnant of it. Let us now advance to the next slide. We are now going to compare the right and left ventricle in shape and thickness of the myocardium. As you can see here, the cavity of the right ventricle has a crescent shape, while the cavity of the left ventricle has nearly a circular shape. Furthermore, the difference in the thickness of the myocardium is obvious. The left ventricle is significantly thicker than the right ventricle. Therefore, when the left ventricle contracts, it will pump blood with greater force and greater pressure than the right ventricle. Why? Well, it is because the left ventricle needs to generate enough pressure for the blood to circulate throughout the body, from head to toe, whereas the right ventricle only needs to generate enough pressure to pump blood to the lungs, which are found just lateral to the heart. If the right ventricle were to produce the same amount of pressure as the left ventricle, our lungs would rupture. The delicate tissue of our lungs are not structurally built to handle the pressure generated by the left ventricle. One thing I need you to remember, despite the differences in the shape of the cavity of these ventricles, the thickness of the myocardium and the force and pressure they generate when they contract, both the right and left ventricles will pump the same volume of blood. In other words, the amount of blood that leaves the right ventricle and enters the pulmonary trunk is equal to the amount of blood that leaves the left ventricle and enters the aorta. Furthermore, both ventricles will contract simultaneously or at the same time. Keep in mind, we will first have atrial contraction followed by ventricular contraction. Lastly, the great vessels of the heart that are directly attached to the heart are the aorta, the pulmonary trunk, the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the pulmonary veins.